In this episode, we'll be talking about why and how we need to go beyond the standard service design tools and methods. We'll talk about the different career paths that lead people to service design and where they go from there. And we'll talk about what it takes to successfully build and lead service design teams in a big corporate. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Patrick, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you do more work that you're proud of and care about by designing and delivering services that are good for people and business. My guest in this episode has a reputation of building and leading service design teams in large corporations, and he's going to share that experience in this episode. His name is Patrick Bach. So like I said, the main theme of this episode will be the secret to successful service design teams that are actually able to make an impact, but we'll also talk about how people shape and mold their service design career and what that means for you. If you enjoyed these episodes and really want to level up your service design skills, don't forget that we bring a new video at least once a week here on this channel. So if you haven't done so already, make sure to subscribe and click that bell icon to be notified when new videos are out. That's all for the introduction. Let's quickly jump into the interview with Patrick. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm awesome. Uh, it's really good to have you on uh, from Canada. Uh, where the global conference is happening this year. And uh, yes. we're also part of the team, right? Yeah, helping to. So the team and I, uh, a few years ago, founded the Canadian chapter of Service Design. And we've been putting on a, a local uh, Canada-wide conference for three years. And this year, we're excited to be helping uh, Birgit and the whole team bring the conference to Toronto. For the people who are watching this like in the future, this is 2019 we're talking about. Yeah, we are on <laughs> June 5th. June 5th. Now, oh, a spoiler alert. Uh, Patrick, also for the people who don't know who you are, could you, could you give like a 30 second introduction? Yeah, uh, my name is Patrick. I currently uh, co lead a service design practice across uh, a large Canadian bank uh, called CIBC. So, this is a new practice. It's been probably a year and a half. And, and Andrea and I, who's my partner in crime, have been hiring and scaling this uh, you know, over the last several months. Um, prior to that, I've, I had a bit of a career in service design for the last maybe six years, um, generally within large uh, organizations. So I, I worked within a telecom, I worked in an insurance company, and now I'm within a bank, which is really interesting. <laughs> uh, I mentioned already that I, I, I help uh, bring the Service Design Canada Conference to life every year with a, with a group of lovely people. Um, and I think a fun little maybe factoid about myself, um, I love games of all kinds. I love board games, video games. Uh, I love the notion of play and how we can, as service designers, bring that uh, that toolkit into how we create experiences, uh, especially for workshops. Hmm. Hmm. Let's make this a playful episode. Let's see what happens. Let's see, yeah. <laughs> do, do, do you remember the very first time you heard about service design? I remember, yeah. It's Tell a long, me. do you want to hear the long version or the short version? The medium version. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so the first time I heard about service design was actually, first I, I was introduced to design thinking, I think was kind of where it started for me. Um, right when I was fairly new in my career, I was working as a junior product manager within a healthcare company. So I was helping their senior product managers. I was kind of wearing a lot of hats. I was helping them develop the go-to-market plan for some new products. I was helping them build out requirements and roadmaps. I was working with the, the dev team uh, to build the development. And I was also trying to help figure out um, you know, some of the ideation and the concept development for new features and functionality. And I remember working in, and I don't want to name names, I don't want to, you know, throw stones, but I remember working in an environment that didn't feel like we, something felt w wrong. We would just get in a room together, a, a bunch of us, um, you know, just talking, always just talking, 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 meeting after meeting, discussing what we think we should do, what we think the product should be about, what we like, what we think is an interesting idea. And it was very, very inside out kind of thinking. And I remember being very young and thinking like, something doesn't make sense. Like it, it feels strange to me that this is how products are developed and products are built. And, you know, being very junior, you don't, you don't know, you think, well, I'm just not very good. I'm just not very, I don't understand when I get better, I'll, 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 I'll clearly, I'll, you know, uh, understand this a little bit better. And I remember feeling a little bit frustrated, especially because we were building, one of the products we were working on 
was a, a service for uh, new moms. And no one on the team was even a woman. They were all dudes. <laughs> Classic. And, yeah. yeah, and it was like a, a few of the guys had kids, so they were always saying, well, my wife does this or my partner does that. And it's just like, really, like, is that how we're doing this? And I remember meeting with a friend of mine who worked at a consultancy in Toronto. Uh, he no longer works there, but he sat down with me and he said, have you ever heard of like user-centered design or design thinking? And I was like, no, I went to business school. I, I studied marketing. So I knew about research and about market research and, you know, all that kind of classic stuff. And, but this was something I had never heard of. And he, he sat down and he walked me through it. And I was like, it's like a light bulb. It was like an, oh my God, this is exactly what we, what we need. This is everything that we're not doing. This is, it, it made sense to me on a level, on a very deep level where right. I yeah. immediately tried to tell everyone about it in my team and say, guys, like we need to go out there. We need to talk to people. We need to build prototypes. And I remember not being very successful at that at the time, convincing anyone. Uh, but that was sort of my first introduction. This was a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I'm uh, hearing, it immediately struck you and you were hooked from that moment. I, that was it. And I remember this is and this is career advice I give to a lot of people. And I and I reckon that recognize that it comes from a certain amount of privilege to be able to say this. But I tried very hard to convince my boss, my leadership that this is a way we should work. And after spending you know over six months beating my head against the wall, I very quickly decided that I either have to choose to work in an environment that is clearly not open to, to changing or find a new place to work where that is. And I made the decision at that time to, to leave. And I, I joined another team where, where there was uh, definitely much more interest in this kind of work. And that was a decision I made. And I, I, I get this question a lot, which is, how do I convince my boss? How do I convince someone? And you can only do so much. You can only say so many things. You can only cheer so many times, show people videos, send them links. But people have to have a willingness and an openness to it as well. And uh, sometimes you have to know when to, when to move on. That's already good advice. Um... Patrick, you gave me, a, you have a super interesting role uh, right now, and I think you have a lot to share with the community. So uh, we're going to do interview jazz. Are you ready to start? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. I'm going oh, to surprise phone. you. I'm, in, I'm going to do them in a different order you gave me. Uh, okay. All right. Topic number one is called new methods. Do you have a question starter? And can you show it to us? Yeah, I'm actually, I have a couple. Um... One is enough I'm, in this case. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, here's mine. How can we, but I might say, how might we? Um, so maybe that question is, how might we integrate new methods into the service design toolkit to make us better service designers? Do we need new methods? Yeah, I think we always, there are always new ways of, of interpreting information, of exploring the world, of, it, of, uh, of interacting with people. There are always new... Um, there's always new research and new science that's teaching us new ways uh, that human beings uh, interact with things, that human beings understand things. And I think that I think it would be very silly for us to somehow feel like we have nothing left to learn and nothing new to explore from a from a tools and methods perspective. Hmm. And what kind of methods are you thinking about? What what are these new methods that are on the horizon that you're curious about? Yeah, I mean, I think there. I think there's like a, a spectrum of like how near they are. I think there's stuff that's understood to be core to service design. I think there's stuff that's right around the periphery where people are understand that this is a beneficial thing, but maybe not. Not all service design teams are are maybe hiring or investing in some of these skill sets. And then I think there's some that are another degree more out there where I think people are still experimenting with some other toolkits, other methodologies, and figuring out how can these work together. And I, I think it's maybe more interesting to talk about those. Um, there are two right now that I've recently in my career had the opportunity to explore. One is a, a bit of a tried and true age old methodology, which is just Lean Six Sigma. Uh, and, and Lean Six Sigma is the Jack Welsh, uh, you know, GE coin, black belt, belt system, uh, you know, process engineering, uh, which was that which was called Six Sigma, and then it got kind of combined with Lean, and now it's Lean Six Sigma. So what's interesting about our team at CIBC is that we are actually our service design team lives within the same team that owns Six Sigma. So Six Sigma typically approach projects from a very quantitative. They analyze the process. They look for inefficiencies, redundancies, and they're they're really really good at understanding the back of house. They're they're experts at that. They're better at that than I think most service designers are. Um, and there's this really interesting juxtaposition of their strengths and then weaknesses, which are 
where lean is maybe not as strong is really understanding the, the emotional, the, the social, the contextual uh, elements that, that live around these services. And that's obviously a strength of, of the type of research we do. But in understanding uh, how to drive process, how to drive efficiency, how to, how to drive change within an organization, I think the people who understand that uh, best are some are oftentimes the, the process engineers. They know how to get things done. They know how to change things, how to navigate the system. And we've had an interesting uh, journey of partnering with these groups and working together jointly on projects where we, were, we know we lean in and we lean out depending on, on, on what's needed and what part of the process we're, we're working on, but we're kind of one team throughout. So I think that's, that's one sort of, uh, I don't want to say it's a new method, but definitely a method that I think service designers um, and a team within an organization that service designers can get closer to. Hmm. Makes sense, because we complain a lot about not being able to actually roll out the things we're designing, right? And like you're describing the people who own the processes, then those might be, they might have the, the key to actually unlocking our concepts, our solutions. Yeah, and, and, and the way these teams are often um, situated in the organization is very enterprise-wide. Uh, they're often uh, very well tapped into the different silos and different organizations. Like I said, they know how to navigate that space. Right. They know how to engage that the leaders. They know how to make things happen. So if, if what we found is that if we can, we can align with them on the service vision that we can design together, and obviously with clients and with, with employees, um, they can really help us uh, move it forward in a meaningful way. Hmm. Um, and I think they also understand the levers of feasibility and viability in a way that we, as designers, maybe don't always appreciate. There's a depth there and there's an expertise there that I think they really bring to the table as well. Hmm. Interesting. And what's the other one? Uh, the other one's a little bit maybe maybe more out there. Depending on who you talk to, I think some people will tell you this is a logical next step for service design. I've definitely had my fair share of people tell me that this is... Uh, the complete opposite of what we believe in as designers and or as service designers, uh, and that's behavioral economics. Um, so I've, over the last few years, had a, many opportunities to not only uh, work with behavioral scientists, but also have them being part of my team, work on projects where behavioral science and service design are both leveraged together. And I have to admit, my first time being exposed to the concept and the first time someone suggested to me that I would work on a project with behavioral scientists, I was a bit nervous. I was actually a bit, I'd say more than nervous, I was a bit um, hesitant. I mm. thought, well, you know, we work so hard as service designers, as, as, as researchers, to convince people and to communicate the value of qualitative approaches to research. And then here comes behavioral science, which is almost entirely rooted in um, you know, very, a very quantitative view of, of how to measure change and how to understand problems. And I was very worried that this, this oil and water combination would, would backfire and, and would be contradictory. It would, you know, we would say left and they would say right. And we would say up and they would say down. And, um, you know, I, I, I approached it with a bit of hesitation, but thought, thankfully the people I was working with were lovely people who were very, very open. They were open to learning about what I was doing and my team was doing. And then we were also open to hearing what they had. And I think we found that actually there is a lot of complementary uh, things about these methodologies that when you when you use them together, and it, I think together they're actually greater than the sum of their parts. And I, I, I would say I fully subscribe to that now. I think I'm fully convinced that I think behavioral economics is, is something of value for service design. Um, I, but I, though I know the jury is not necessarily uh, fully out on that yet. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm I'm all in with what you're saying. I think I made even a video where I talked about we should study behavioral economics much mm -hmm. more as service designers. And it was a great episode um, with Luke Betty. I'll, I'll link to it somewhere over here. He also is like, we can, yeah, somewhere over here. It's uh, no. fruit. <laughs> but it's, we can learn so much more about how people behave and why they do certain stuff and actually build up on that rather than just guessing right there's and uh, from what i'm hearing you say is uh, and that is what i like about the show also is finding uh, the fringes of service design and finding where service design overlaps with other fields so it's much rather finding new connections and those new connections bring in new tools that rather than inventing stuff where can we connect with right is that's that's what i'm hearing you say at least 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's definitely a few people I follow or I'm connected with on LinkedIn who are very vocal about this. And I, I, I definitely say I would subscribe is that we as service designers should not try to be everything. We should not try to embody every possible role and skill set. And I think there's a, there's definitely a, a sometimes it feels like there's a bit of a, a, a movement towards this or a feeling that service designers need to somehow have all the answers and, and be able to to not only design solutions but do research and do change management and understand implementation and and, and you know you know sort of uh, be leaders and and you know talk the executive talk and I think there's a certain amount of that that's true that you need to understand all those worlds and you need to um, you know. Uh, you know, understand the, the different the different roles and teams and incentive structures to be able to navigate them. But there are people already out there who are very good at doing a lot of these things, who are experts in doing a lot of these things. And I think it's, you know, it, our role is to embrace them and our role is to, to collaborate with them rather than trying to somehow duplicate or replicate what they are already doing and somehow believing that we can do it better. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to say that anyone thinks that way, but I think that's a dangerous mindset to have. I agree. And I think that we should be more embracing of other teams and and, and, and design is really just the backbone. Design, service design is just the, the through line um, that we can maybe use to orient and organize these different teams together. But um, we should definitely rely on the, the outside expertise of teams where, that, where it's available. And I think this ties in really uh, neatly with the second topic we can talk about, uh, which is, you might have guessed it already, it's called career paths. Okay, let me <laughs> let me do my thing. Sorry, my I have it on my phone and it closed. Okay, so I know I showed you. Sorry, my thing. I know I'm being a bad guest now. My I have to reopen. We have a secured email app, so anytime oh, I reopen gotcha. it, I have to go through a three passwords. So three let me do passwords. That. So um, how about this? Who are the people? who are choosing career paths in service design. Hmm. Who are the brave, brave or smart or, or, or silly, foolish, who are they? Who are they? And I think that's, that's really, I think you made an interesting point at the beginning, uh, which I, I don't know if this was part of the, officially part of the episode or not, but you said a lot of people don't even identify as service designers. Right. There was a, at the first Canadian conference, we had a bit of a panel debating like the, the merit, like does it matter that people are labeling themselves, their titles, their roles as service designers, or does it not matter? Like as long as we're, we're, we're folk, we have the same values and the same principles and you know, we use roughly similar maybe tools and frameworks, does it, does it matter at all? And there's a, there's a good healthy debate around that, whether it matters or not. And I don't know that I have a firm foot uh, or firm standing in one camp or the other. I feel like there's probably benefits to both. But I think that the interesting thing that we, Andrea and I think about, Andrea is my, my partner uh, at CIBC who, who leads the practice with me. Um, we actually try to go out of our way to find very diverse backgrounds, very diverse people who um, come from all different kinds of walks of life. So when we're hiring, we're not just looking for people who have, who've had or are service designers currently, um, but certainly people who are more aligned from a values perspective. Um, I think that there is a lot of people who are doing service design or service design style work out there who may have never even heard of the term, you know? So I think that it's, it, we're putting ourselves in a bit of a box when we start to, I think, only seek out that kind of candidate. So we're trying to be very intentional and in just seeing who's doing interesting work that, that sort of subscribes to a similar um, set of values that we do. I think those values are obvious, human, you know, human centeredness. Uh, you know, being willing to, to challenge uh, and to ask the big questions, you know, you know, being iterative and not being precious about ideas. Like these are those those values we have. And what are some peripheral fields, you know, and sometimes we, we look in spaces where you might not, you know, think you might find these people like engineering, marketing. These are fields where I think there are a lot of brilliant people who are make for tremendous service signers where maybe I don't know. Um, we maybe classically wouldn't, you know, think to find them. So I think that's a really interesting thing. And I think some of the best and brightest service designers I know today, um, some of them, not all, of course, were never went to design school, didn't, you know, could, you know, unfortunately couldn't use uh, Adobe Illustrator for, to save their life, but understand what design, the value and the purpose of design and are some of the best design leaders and problem solvers that I know out there. So I think that's um, in the eye of the beholder potentially, but for me, this has always been a, tr a truth. Well, it, it's it, I think like we're proving it right now. You have like you, you told me you have a business degree, right? You went to business school, 
I, I was, I'm a trained software engineer and still we're here at talking on the service design show about service mm -hmm. design. So that's, I, I, I think this proves your point totally. Um, but if we go back to the question, like, yeah, you told me you, you are seeking out people, but do you also uh, see a pattern in people who uh, uh, consciously choose the path of becoming a service designer for whatever that may be? Yeah, uh, I think it, I, I think like who are the people who who choose the path of service design? I, I think there is a lot of qualities there. I think the one for me is, and maybe it's a, maybe this is starting with a negative. I think it's a lot of times people who are a bit. Uh, I, I know we often say we need, we are optimistic as designers, and that's one of our best qualities. But I, I think there's a sense of frustration with how the the system works, and uh -huh. the system can be, you know, you know, wage inequality. It can be how you feel about sort of access to healthcare. Right, it can be about right. rights, what, what, whatever kind of rights. I think there's this general sense of um, the world is not operating in a way, or these systems are not operating in a way that is equitable and fair to the peoples uh, who, who really rely on them. And I think oftentimes I think people's interest in service design comes from this desire and this burning desire to, to change. Uh, and I think it, the change is hard, it's slow, uh, it's painful. So I think another quality that I think is really interesting in, in, in strong service designers is resiliency. I think mm. you need to have mm. thick skin, you need to be resilient, you need to be able to weather the storm. I think, you know, we were just talking about like fees implementation. That's just one. That's like, to me, like, you know, in terms of levels of frustration, that's frustrating, but that's there. There's so many other bigger changes that we try to strive for that are, you know, that, that will happen, I think eventually, but are just sl slow to happen and take, take time. So, um, I love seeing service designers who are not serve, not called service designers, but these change agents who are really trying to attack and, uh, highlight the the unmet needs and highlight these problems that are not being discussed and attacking um, sort of very smartly and strategically though trying to attack and change the system in a way um, to, to sort of create a better outcome for for those people um, so I think that's something that's the person I th those are the types of people I think who I found gravitate towards service sign mm -hmm. and that's why it doesn't matter what your background is just anyone in the world could feel this way and could feel empowered emboldened and then they can um, you know, when, once they find service design or that, the, you know, once they sort of become aware of it, like I became aware of design thinking, what it does, it gives you a bit of a, a framework or language to talk about how you might change the system. Because otherwise, you, have, you don't know where to begin. You don't have the right tools. You don't have the right, you know, frameworks to even begin to think about it. Yeah. And so service design gives us a shared vocabulary, shared, shared toolkit, shared mindset that allows us to collaborate. Yeah, and then solve these wicked problems that, exactly. that we think we need to solve. Absolutely. And um, this is also, I, I think, the debate that has been going on since the day service design started. Like, is there a service designer or uh, how should we much rather be talking about service design teams that uh, where people have certain roles, certain expertise and everybody, if you're part of a service design team, you're a service designer, but not necessarily with, uh, with the exact yeah. skills that your teammate has. And I think that's exactly correct. Like I say, I say, let me let me just provide a personal anecdote, or not even an anecdote. I can just reflect on our team, how we're building this team here. I think what you just described is is the philosophy we have. Is everyone on the team has a title of service designer because you know within an organization, it helps people on the same team need to have the same title. Otherwise, it's just very confusing. Um, but definitely, like the idea that service design is a combination of skill sets, it's a combination of it's shared values, but then all these different kind of this constellation of skill sets that are necessary and you can bucket them in terms of like research and design and sense making and whatever, yeah, you yeah. Know, all these different things. And not everyone needs to be good at everything. Exactly. Everyone needs to have an expertise in one or two areas. I, I don't know. I'm sure you're, you're the, the watchers of the show are familiar with the idea of T-shaped people. So we, we often look for T-shaped people and we look for deep expertise in one area or the other. Um, but the expectation on our team, at least, is that everyone even though you're not the expert at everything, everyone is expected to do everything. Hmm. So hmm. no one's just doing research and no one's just building prototypes and no one's just you know, presenting or, or managing stakeholders. Everyone is doing everything collectively, collaboratively. So the, there's the, the risk of knowledge hmm. transference and knowledge sharing and the cracks that can emerge when things have to get passed around or that we reduce that risk. 
but certainly where people can lean in with different skill sets. Mm. And I think different skill sets from different backgrounds, from different perspectives, yields the single most important thing for any design team, which is tension. We have a lot of tension on our team, but I, we like to say it's very good, healthy tension and that we don't always agree on what we should do. We don't always agree on what the right thing is. We, we don't always agree on the right approach, but we are able to, to bring our different perspectives and have that healthy dialogue. And almost every time the output is, is generally uh, better than uh, what it had been with, without that having that conversation. So mm-hmm. we know mm-hmm. we're onto something when the team is like, you know, when there's, friction. And yeah. when there's friction, there's tension. We know that this is good. We're talking about something important. Hmm. Man, you, you're you're stringing the topics together really nicely, and because we're into the topic of teams, and let's talk about not how you actually maybe who is in the team, but how do you lead them? So the third topic is leading service design teams, and you should okay, have so some interesting to, things I, to say. And <laughs> you need to log to in like, again. <laughs> no, I, I got it. I'm just trying to think like what's what's an easy question or what's a uh, because how can we is kind of boring how about this how how far how much or how far um maybe how much how much do we actually need to lead uh, our service design team so maybe this notion of like kind of creating autonomous self uh, self uh orienting self-determining teams versus maybe a more heavy-handed approach to leadership why hmm. don't we talk about that mm-hmm. what are your experiences um I think like 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 most questions, the answer ends up being a little bit boring. Is that it ends up being probably in the middle? Mm-hmm. I, I think a little bit of both. I I think one of the things we try to do here is um, we want everyone on our team to feel like they are empowered and have the access, to the information, and the tools that they need to make decisions about projects, make decisions about designs, uh, and, and move forward. So. You know, it's interesting when you see people coming from different backgrounds. There are certain people sometimes on my team who really look to authority or look to to myself or Andrea. Like, is this okay? Like, hey, I made this change here. Like, do you want to review with me? And like, to me, this is like, this is a symptom of a problem. Because when someone's behaving that way, they've clearly been in a, in a system or a team where that was, you know, sort of clearly um, the baseline expectation. And I... I feel very strongly that that is like a, an oppressive environment that I that I don't want the team to be in. So you know, certainly there are big decisions, you know, milestones, you know, uh, strategic decisions that we want to make as a team. But I, I certainly really believe that everyone, you know, we've all, like I said, we all do everything together. We've all done the research together. We've all, you know, synthesized it. We've all built these prototypes together. So you know, no one person has, in my opinion, I guess, more. Uh, you know, more authority or more, uh, you know, a stronger voice in terms of what what the thing should be. Mm-hmm. So I think that's something we're trying to we're trying to instill in the team to feel that they can feel confident making the decision that they know to be the right one for the design, for the product, for the service. And, and then you know, obviously, and then we test it. We test everything. So right, right. That, that's the beauty there. So I think that that's an important thing that I think the team is trying to still figure out. I think there's still you know those classic hierarchical norms that are are hard to completely. And to be fair, there are still some things that you need to approve and that you need to sign off on. So it's it's not completely uh, autonomous, but I think we're 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 trying to get closer to that. So my question would be like, um, I'm not so much interested in those formal uh, sign off things, but uh, how does a team like that? Uh, where where does it get its direction from? Like, how, well, what is setting? What is the compass? What is setting the northern star? So I. I think Andrea and I have, a, when we created this team, Andrea and I spent a lot of time talking about our vision. And we talk about our vision more in terms of like, why, why are we doing this? Why are we building this team? Why are we bringing these people into these jobs? Um, what are we trying to do? And what do we believe in? And I think that that's kind of the very baseline that Andrea and I sort of initially established. And you know, when you're hiring someone, you're selling them on that vision. You're promising them that this is what they're buying into, and this is the role and the job. And then, then we need to deliver on that. So I think right. we, I think we set the tone with that baseline. I think the people we are hiring, um, obviously, sub- are, are buying in and are subscribing to, to to that on some level. But we don't want to be so daft as to believe that this doesn't evolve, or that as you actually, you know, like any design, as you start to put it in the world and you start to really experience it. You may feel differently about it. You may want to change it. So I think Andrew and I set the initial tone. We've hired people in who have a shared value and understanding. But you know what we do and what we believe is the best next step for the team is is a is a conversation we have as a team. Uh, 
there is a shared benefit for the team to succeed for everyone involved, not just for Andrea and I. Uh, everyone succeeds if the team succeeds. Everyone succeeds if our projects are successful. So we're very much, we open that up on a, on a weekly basis to have those dialogues. Mm. And we're actually, interestingly, we're planning a session in three weeks on, Jan, on June 28th where we're going to have a bit of a reflection. We're, in, we're inviting an outside facilitator to spend the whole day with us to reflect on the vision of the team, the purpose of the team. Do we feel like we're achieving it? What, are we working on the right projects? Are we working in the right ways? What needs to change? And, and allowing the team to be very very critical right. of, of the team. And I think that that's healthy. I think I think we need to do this on a regular basis. Otherwise, we just become, you know, we, we're just exactly. buying into our own, uh, yeah. What is um, what have you found to be the most challenging thing in regards to? Well, let's still call it leading or building or crafting, shaping a service design team. I think one of the challenging things uh, there's uh, there's so many challenging things. I think leading the team. I think um, I'm trying to think. There's so many of these challenges. Maybe one that might be interesting to talk about is. Um, I, 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 there's a couple on my mind and I'm trying to pick which one might be more appropriate, but I think service designers in my experience are less career oriented in the more traditional sense that they don't look at the org structure and look at it and say, you know, what I want to do next is be at the next level. And then after the next level, I'm going to work hard and be at the next level. Um, whereas, you know, tradition, I work in, in private cor large corporate and most 99% of people, uh, and I don't want to say enough, sorry, I'm going to take that back. I don't want to generalize, but I think a lot of people, um, you know, have that very kind of, you know, I want to progress. I want mm -hmm. the next thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think, mm -hmm. I don't think service designers look at progress as the next level. Right. I think they want to in, enrich themselves in a way that is broader rather than deeper. Whereas, you know, right. you typically, so I think, and, and the challenge in organization is that, okay, if you're a marketing person and, and you want to succeed, your goal is to move up the corporate ladder, there are some things you're going to do. You're going to become better at marketing, but then you're going to have to go and work in product. You're going to go work in, you know, in customer experience, and you're going to do that breadth within the organization. And typically, most large organizations promote people based on this generalist, like people who are good, who have demonstrated aptitude in, in many different businesses. The challenge for a service designer, I think, is that the opportunities to learn the types of things you would want to learn are not as uh, not presented as as uh, frequently within a large organization. One of the one of the a lot of people that on teams that I've been on that I've led have often left the organization because they don't know where else to go. Right, so right. I'm on I'm on the service line team. There is one. Right, uh, right. I want to become better at these other things. I want to expand my horizon, but I don't know where else to go within the organization. You know, you can go work in digital, which is good. There's obviously a lot of design. Uh, design work within digital, but but if you you know, so some people go there, but other people feel like well, digital is you know very constrained to one channel. I I, I want to kind of work in the bigger picture. So some people go to market research teams, but but some people don't don't want to just do that that style right. of, of of research. So what people tend to do, and what I've observed, and I think a lot of my friends were also leading other service line teams, is you tend to see this like two to three year shelf life. People join an organization, they're they get two, three years out of it. They learn it. They, they, and then they're ready to move on. And they, they want what they want is to change context. They want to go from uh, I want to work in a retail, a grocery mm. store, mm. and now different I want to work challenges, in a bank, yeah, different problem spaces. And by changing problem spaces, you go out of your comfort zone. You learn. You interact with different leaders, and you grow that way rather than growing in the more traditional right, kind of right. up the corporate ladder. And, and that's a challenge when you're building and sustaining a team. Of is course, that you yeah. have this heavy turnover. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess uh, we haven't, from what I remember, we haven't really talked about on the show uh, about uh, service design career paths. So wh what is a yeah. typical service design? Is there a typical service design career path? That would be a really interesting t topic for, for another episode. And I guess this is also the reason uh, we get a lot of applications at our studio from people who specifically want to work at an agency because they get the opportunity to move from project to project, right? That's where the, yeah. uh, the challenge is. And maybe that's also right. with internal teams, but... It's so fascinating. Like, we mostly hire from agency because the pain point of agency is I don't actually get to see the impact of my work. Right. I push the deck over, the client doesn't do anything, or they go in the opposite direction. So the benefit of in-house is that and, and I and I, I believe that the future of, of sustainable service design needs in-house teams. 
I think we need the agency and we need the outside perspective. Exactly. We need the this expertise, but we need in-house teams to to follow through. So I think the future of service design is, is a combination of in-house teams working with agency and not one or the other entirely. Um, but you're right. And I think I think people go to agency when they're sick and tired of the system beating them down and realizing that, oh, it's so hard to drive real change. I'm maybe what I really want to do is just hone my skills at these other things and explore these media problems in an environment that feels maybe less, um, you know, oppressive. I think one of the other challenges is that um, a lot of service designers um, that I know tend to, you know, uh, not always want to work within these very heavy capitalistic systems and organizations like banks and telecom, where it's, you know, it's very profit driven. It's very, you know, quarter by quarter. And I think that that in and of itself is almost antithetical to what service design is trying to do and the change in the world that we want to see. So I think that creates a tension for mm -hmm. a lot of designers who work in house. I think you can either see it as I need to be part of the system to change the system. Or I'm fed up of the system. I'd rather just not engage with it. I'd rather just go work in an agency or in a not-for-profit or in another space where I don't have to deal with this this mm. cognitive dissonance. Mm. Patrick, um, super interesting topics. Uh, much more we could talk about. But I want to give you the opportunity to ask the viewers and the listeners of the show a question. Is there something that you'd like to for us to think about? <sighs> yeah. Um, I think I think what we need to think about is um, the resiliency of service design teams. I think what we need to think about is the resiliency of service design. Um, not to say that I don't believe that service design is has a future and service design is something that I believe in, but I think we haven't. I'm a true believer. I'm bought in 100%, but I'm very critical of the fact that I don't truly believe that we've clearly still communicated the value of this approach. I don't think we've made it clear enough or obvious enough why this is something worth pursuing. And I think we still very much rely on a small number of champions and people who need to really kind of bring us in and, and champion us, uh, even internally and certainly as agencies, I, I think that that's a reality. I think that the, the, the why we need to do service line and why this is important is something that is a message that we haven't fully articulated in the way that it needs to be. And I think that that's something that we need to reflect on is like, why are people Every time someone says they're not interested in doing service design, why why not? You know, what is it about that and how can we learn from that experience and, and get better at and are we making assumptions about what we think we're offering and the value that we think we bring to people where maybe we're making assumptions about what our users need. So I think we need to be very critical about this. So maybe the question is like maybe engaging in some reflection around the next time someone challenges you on service, the value of design or service design and thinking through like how do we answer that? Why, why do we become so defensive? What assumptions might we be making? And I think if we can be self-aware that way, I think that's going to show us the path forward. Hmm. Maybe you're, uh, yeah, I, let, let's leave it at that. Great question. I think uh, uh, a lot, uh, gives a lot of room to, to think about. <laughs> very, very uh, loaded, heavy question. Sorry. No, yeah. You know, I, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, we're, uh, we're so in love with what we do that we sometimes get blinded by I, I think we absolutely do. I, I think we need to be very self-critical of what we do and the value we think we bring and, and, and to whom we bring it. And yeah, I am. Um, <clears throat> I've a practice that I've been trying to to do, actually do is after a project as my clients, what value did I actually bring? What is the biggest challenge that I've solved for you? And the answers yeah. you'll get from that, <laughs> they will literally blow you away. They will tell you completely different things that you than you imagined what you are actually offering. So that's a way to actually do this. I, I love project retros. I think they're, I think to your point, they're, they are a great source of insight, but I, I, and I think those are interesting. I think it's, um, I think it'd be interesting to have those com similar conversations as well with people who decide not to work with us. Mm -hmm. And I think we don't, we usually walk away or we say, okay, no, you know, but I, I think it's just as meaningful. Like, why not? You know, what are you right. trying to do? What do you think we're trying to do? How, you know, I think that's, that's something worth thinking about too. Mm -hmm. Patrick, thanks so much uh, for sharing what you're doing, sharing what's on your mind. A lot of topics, I think, that are uh, that are sort of projecting the future discussions of our of our field. Um, so thanks again for making the time. Thank you, and I, I just want to be clear that I don't have the answers to these questions. I'm, I'm hoping that maybe some of you guys do. These are just some of the things that are on my mind right now. Thanks, Perfect. Mark.
So what is your take on Patrick's question? Why aren't people buying service design? What are the biggest objections and how do you counter them? Leave a comment down below. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you check out the next one because it's full of knowledge bombs as well. And if you haven't done so already, click that subscribe button. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.